This is the program on constitutional government at Harvard. I'm Harvey Mansfield, and our guest today is James Pearson. Uh, James Pearson um, graduated from uh, Michigan State University in 1968, got a PhD in 1973, also from Michigan State. He had a short academic career teaching at Iowa State, Indiana University, and the University of Pennsylvania, you know, the latter a little longer from 1976 to 1982. But then he entered uh, the field of philanthropy and he was uh, from 1985 to 2005 executive director of the John M. Olin Foundation. And he's now president of the William E. Simon Foundation and a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Plus, he's on the boards of the Pinkerton Foundation, the Thomas Smith Foundation, the Hoover Institution, the Donors Trust, that's to name a few. And yet, in addition to this career in philanthropy, he's been extremely active as a scholar and an author. Prolific is what one could say. His books are Political Tolerance in American Democracy, 1982, Camelot and the Cultural Revolution, uh, in 2007, The Pursuit of Liberty in 2008, uh, The Shattered Consensus, The Rise and Decline of America's Post-War Political Order, The Inequality Hoax, these are more recent, and he has many political articles in the Wall Street Journal, Commentary, National Affairs, The New Criterion, City Journal, and others, and he likes to write with our friend Naomi Schaefer Riley. And he's going to talk today on the Great Society 50 years later. Jim. Okay. Thank you, Hi. Harvey. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'm going to speak about the Great Society. That's our subject. We have a, a lot of slides. I'm not sure I can get through all of them. I'm going to go through them as quickly as I can. Anna is going to uh, move from one to the other on my signal. Uh, so let's, uh, Anna, go to that first slide. I'll just say next uh, when we get done. So uh, we'll speak about the Great Society. Uh, I have a short description there that you can all read about what the Great Society was. I have no overall thesis about the Great Society. Uh, I have a number of observations to make. Uh, uh, you know, which I'll, I'll go through uh, as we run through the slides. And, uh, but uh, what I hope to do is go through a lot of the pertinent facts and policies of the Great Society so that we all under kind of understand what it was all about. And then we can somewhat debate on what it meant or what its implications were. Of course, the 1960s was known for the cultural revolutions of that period. The Great Society was more of a legislative program, uh, not unrelated to the cultural revolutions, but to some extent it was brought, <laughs> it, was, it was made controversial by those things. So the Great Society was the third major reform movement in the United States in the 20th century, following progressivism and the New Deal. Uh, it ran under the presidency of Lyndon Johnson, basically from 1964 to 1966. You know, by the end of 1965, uh, the momentum had been lost and uh, it became submerged in other controversies. Uh, the Great Society expanded the role of government in every area of American life and set the agenda for political debate down to the present day. Every year, uh, the federal government uh, drafts a budget and many of the debates about the budget are, how are we gonna handle uh, these uh, great society programs? How much are we gonna spend? How are we gonna reform them, et cetera, et cetera? Because just about all of them are still in place. Uh, kind of when we look historically at these three great reform movements, I think the great society was the most important. Progressivism was known for mostly for constitutional amendments. Uh, you had the Federal Reserve Act and the FDA, but you had the 16th Amendment, the Income Tax Amendment, you had the 17th Amendment, the direct, direct election of senators, and the 19th Amendment, women's suffrage. Uh, by comparison, the New Deal was almost entirely legislative, and so is the Great Society. Uh, so uh, 
but in terms of scope and scale, uh, I think the Great Society uh, was my, had much greater impact and range than these other two reform movements. One could say that the Great Society succeeded greatly because as I say, the programs are still in place, we still debate them. Uh, in some ways, uh, it failed. Why? Because some of the policies developed uh, unfortunate consequences such as out of wedlock births, welfare dependency, other aspects of it, uh, which we continue to fight about. In addition, uh, the, it, it, it also created like those earlier ones, a great deal of dissatisfaction among the liberals who created it because there are great expectations of what was going to be accomplished by the great society. And in the end, it didn't meet those expectations which has created uh, a kind of frustration among people on the left who uh, continue to support those programs as to what they might accomplish. So let's move on, Anna, next one. So let's do some preliminaries to the 1960s. And you know, one, there are a lot of them, but uh, one which was revisited in the 1960s with the Immigration Restriction Act of 1924. So there's a great deal of immigration in the United States from Europe uh, from 1880 or 90 to 1920. And on a bipartisan basis, uh, the Congress and the president at that time, Republican President Coolidge passed uh, a restriction act of 1924, which set up quotas, immigration quotas for all the immig uh, immigrant groups coming from Europe. Uh, limiting uh, uh, immigration to 2% each year of the foreign born population. That was about 250,000 in 1924 compared to a million per year from 1900 to 1914. And the proportion of immigrants uh, had to be the same per country as in 1890. And that meant immigration favored people coming from Canada, Great Britain, and Western Europe, Germany and the Scandinavian countries and penalizing immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, so which had, which had grown rapidly from 1900 to the first world war. Immigration was banned from China and Japan. Basically we banned immigration from Asia. Uh, there had been a ban enacted in 1882 uh, against immigration from China, this codified it. Uh, no bans on immigration for the Western Hemisphere. And as a consequence of this law, there was almost no immigration of the United States from about 1924 into the 1970s. Okay, next one, Anna. The other thing uh, I'll mention is the Social Security Act of 1935, which became the foundation for the American welfare state. Uh, Social Security consisted of old age insurance uh, for people past age 65, paid via payroll tax on wages and salaries, half by employee, half by employer. That's still in place today with some modifications. Uh, unemployment insurance uh, was added to the mix and so was welfare. Welfare at that time was defined as aid to widows and orphans. And at the time it was thought that uh, children born out of wedlock would not be eligible for support under the welfare system. Uh, it was a small payroll tax. You know, one thing about the Social Security Act was that uh, compared to what happened in the 1960s, Social Security is fairly easy to implement. You just slap a payroll tax on wages and salaries, throw it into a fund, invest the surplus in treasuries, and you send checks every month to people over age 65. There's not a lot of social difficulties there because people of that age are not expected to work. You don't have to send them to school. There are very few social problems associated with them. It's a pretty clean program and it was fairly easy to do. That created an illusion that other programs uh, parallel to it would be just as easy to implement, which was not the case. Okay, let's move on, Anna. So by the end of World War II, the United States has a fledgling welfare state. 
And because of World War II, it also has a large national security state with a large national defense. The interesting thing about this is that from 1930 to 1945, both of these things evolve. A welfare state and a national security state, neither in place in 1930. Uh, very large changes, but the United States comes out of that period with a great deal of consensus in the country about the whole thing. That's very unusual, that when large changes happen, there are, great, there are really great fights about it and a great deal of conflict as you know we saw in the Civil War and some other things. But we came out of this period with a great deal of momentum and consensus. I would say that the United States formed itself into a nation state by virtue of those three wars from the Civil War to World War I to World War II. The United States was not formed as a nation state, but as a union uh, with a Republican form of government. All the rhetoric from the founding to the Civil War was based upon the concept of union and uh, adaptation to local circumstances which allowed the United States to expand as rapidly as it did. It was Abraham Lincoln who starts to talk about the United States as a nation state. Uh, the idea of a nation was a concoction of the French Revolution, not the American Revolution. The French said, we're gonna destroy all the estates and we're gonna create a single people of the French with a common language and a common educational system. We'll create a nation. That was somewhat juxtaposed against the American idea of a union, which persisted down to the Civil War. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is inaugurated talking about a union, and by the time he's finished, he's talking about a nation. And I think probably in Lincoln's view, uh, when slavery was eliminated, the United States was no longer composed of rival social systems. And you can now speak about the country as a nation state. And so from these three wars, uh, all requiring common sacrifices, everybody participates in them. We now have national cemeteries and national anthem and all the rest. And the United States emerges as a, as a full blown nation state by the end of World War II um, with a great deal of momentum behind it. I would say it was, the, it was the great society, which was made possible by the fact that the United States became a nation state. It's hard to think of a welfare state absent a nation state. In any case, they're coterminous with one another. They evolve in common with one another. The people have to, have to feel that they are in this enterprise together before they'll sacrifice for a welfare state. If people hate one another or fighting with one another, and they're unlikely to create a welfare state. Uh, so, you know, the United States emerges at this period with both a welfare state, and it was, I suggest that it was the great society which, which speeds a transition of the United States from a nation state to something we might call a post-national state or a multicultural diverse democracy of the kind that we're now beginning to live in. And we'll see what this looks like once it matures. Let's move ahead. So 1950s, as I said, very little immigration in the United States through that whole period. But the United States grows in the post-war period by uh, uh, it, through its own birth rate. We have about 4.3 million live births per year from 1953 to 1962. Added up, that's some 40 million people uh, born into the United States and by the mid 60s, they're going to college. So we don't need immigration to expand our population in that period. We do it through domestic births. As you see in 1950, the population is 150 million. By 1960, it's 181 million. And this is all done by domestic births, not by immigration. All right, let's go ahead. All right, uh, you know, we have a kind of a national community by virtue of the fact we have just three television networks basically all saying the same thing. 1950, very few people had televisions. By 1960, everybody has one. And this tends to create a national community and kind of builds on this consensus that we're all familiar with, okay? Suburbanization is a large factor of the 1950s. Uh, you know, the suburbs are growing much faster in other parts of the country. Uh, and so by the 1960s and 70s, the United States is more a suburban 
than an urban country, okay? Important background, US Supreme Court uh, bans segregation in the schools aimed mainly at the South by a nine to nothing vote. This is 1954, we know all about this, this is a case that comes out of Kansas. Uh, it's unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. It's important to point out that in the 1960s, there was kind of a perfect storm of a political alignment. We had uh, Congress, the presidency, and the Supreme Court all pushing forward in a liberal direction. The Warren Court was responsible for many uh, uh, liberal decisions in this whole period. Uh, and of course, many of, the, uh, many of the policies of the great society were appealed to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court upheld them all. So we have a liberal court, liberal Congress, liberal presidency in the 1960s. That kind of thing doesn't line up very often and it contributes to what we saw in the 1960s. Now, the Supreme Court was never able to enforce segregation of the schools in the South to any great degree. Uh, there are a few episodes, but by the early to mid 60s, the South is still largely segregated. The colleges were segregated and the schools were mostly segregated with a few exceptions. And despite the fact that in 1954, the Supreme Court makes this ruling. Why does that happen? And why do they later get integrated? It's the great society that allows for the integration of the South. Here's something just to remember. Here's the US federal budget in 1960. It's basically defense, social security, and a few other things, the post office, customs, law enforcement, federal pensions, veteran benefits, that's about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the election of 1960, razor thin election. Uh, everybody wondered, what's the difference between these two candidates, Kennedy and Nixon? There's no difference between them. Uh, it was kind of a Me Too election. And Arthur Schlesinger wrote a book saying the reason to vote for Kennedy is that he exuded energy. Kennedy's charisma is the reason to vote for Kennedy because he reflected the kind of energy that the United States should have. But in terms of policy, uh, Nixon kept saying, I agree with you, I agree with you, I agree with you. But as we know, Kennedy looked better and he won a razor thin vote. Nixon could have contested it decided not to. The Republican National Committee did file a fair number of lawsuits against the vote in Texas, Illinois, without much success. Okay. Of course, the Kennedys uh, uh, were extremely popular when Kennedy was shot in 1963. The Gallup poll ratings had him 60, 65%. He was a celebrity. He hung out with movie stars and that sort of thing. His brother-in-law was a movie star. Uh, Marilyn Monroe came to the White House. Marilyn Monroe sang to him in, at his birthday party at Madison Square Garden in 1962. It was a mixture of uh, celebrity and politics that aided the Kennedys greatly. Kennedy's uh, Cold War program was focused heavily on the Third World, not on the East-West conflict, uh, more on revolutions in places like Vietnam uh, and Cuba especially. Uh, and Kennedy proposed to fight the Cold War in the realm of ideas as a bunch in the military area. The, the West was superior because of its freedom uh, and the possibilities that it provided. He went to Berlin in 1963 and compared East and West Berlin in that regard, a very popular speech. We'll go ahead. Cuba was kind of the force of it. In the early 1960s, the Cold War reached its peak, probably in terms of danger. Uh, we're on the verge of a, of a uh, perhaps a nuclear war in 1962 and the Cuban Missile Crisis. And Kennedy enforces a naval blockade that makes the Soviet Union somewhat back down. Uh, on account of this, two years later, Khrushchev was pushed aside by the Politburo because of the uh, brazen nature of placing missiles in Cuba. And by 1964, Kennedy's not around either. Uh, Kennedy's program, basically a tax cut 
based on Keynesian principles. Uh, he cut every marginal tax rate, including the highest rate from 91% to 70%. Ronald Reagan reduced it from 70% to 50%. It's about 39% today with a few exceptions. Economic growth in that period, uh, uh, it was passed in 1964 under Lyndon Johnson. Uh, economic growth is 6% per year in that period. Uh, federal revenues flowed in. That was the highest economic growth in a three-year period in the entire post-war period. That's 6% per year. Um, which also helped to fund the Great Society and perhaps created some illusions about where economic growth was going in the future. Okay, let's go ahead. So at that time, the civil rights movement escalates in the South, uh, some uh, and broadcast heavily on television, civil rights demonstrations in Birmingham and other places, uh, police dogs attacking demonstrators and all the rest broadcast on television, not a good look for the South. Go ahead. And on June 11th, 1963, federal courts ordered uh, the University of Alabama to admit two black students, I think into the graduate school. Uh, George Wallace stands on the schoolhouse door uh, saying they, should, they can't be allowed to come in. He says segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. That's the deputy attorney general telling him to stand aside or else he'll be forcibly removed. He did stand aside, the black students were admitted. That night, Kennedy endorsed the civil rights bill. Uh, and uh, which was basic, it was based mainly on the Commerce Clause, I'll get to it in a few minutes, but for the rest of 1963, he's promoting uh, the Civil Rights Act as a basic piece of his domestic agenda. Continued demonstrations for the summer of 1963, 250,000 people march in Washington and Martin Luther King gives his famous I Have a Dream speech. So momentum for civil rights is building in this period. Uh, a bomb hits a church in Birmingham, Alabama, kills four young kids. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan and the Southerners are fighting back against the civil rights movement and it's kind of somewhat reaching a peak in this period when Kennedy is killed in Dallas by a sniper at the end of 1963 and his assassin is shot on national television two days later. Oswald is a communist. He had recently defected from the Soviet Union uh, he was a partisan of Castro's revolution in Cuba. He understood the Kennedys were trying to assassinate Castro. Uh, that is probably his motivation in shooting Kennedy. Uh, we won't go into why he was then shot, but probably two thirds of the country would have murdered him, the Oswald uh, if they had a chance to, and some guy had a chance to and shot him. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, says that we have to honor Kennedy uh, by passing his program, which is basically the Civil Rights Act. But Lyndon Johnson says that Kennedy is really too conservative for him, uh, that he is an aggressive New Deal liberal. Kennedy was much too conservative and he planned to go much further than Kennedy in the future, which he did. Uh, in 1964, he gives his Great Society speech. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Great Society is, of course, it is passed in a time of affluence. Uh, the, the New Deal is passed in a period of unemployment and destitution. The Great Society is a great deal about uh, not only employment, but also about the quality of life of the American civilization. He talks about the environment. He talks about the arts. He talks about education. He talks about all the things uh, that uh, make social life worthwhile. And he names it for the Great Society. Name of a book by a socialist, a British socialist published in 1914. I think Richard Goodwin is the one who came up with the idea of a great society and Johnson sold it. So the first thing that Johnson gets through is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, which 
prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, religion, color, national origin, and grants the federal government powers to enforce the law. It was uh, passed by an overwhelming vote in the House and the Senate. There were more Democrats who opposed it than Republicans. Mostly Republicans supported the Civil Rights Act. Uh, the Southern Democrats, of course, opposed it and tried to block it, uh, but were unable to do so. And uh, Johnson used the momentum from the Kennedy assassination to some degree and those events in the South to push through the Civil Rights Amendment. As I say, 80% of the Republicans in the Congress voted yes, only two thirds of the Democrats voted yes. So without Republicans, it doesn't pass. Nonetheless, because of Barry Goldwater, the Republicans were tagged as opposing the Civil Rights Act. Uh, one thing to note is Title VI, uh, Civil Rights Act banned discrimination in programs and institutions receiving federal funds. Uh, that becomes important later, as are other aspects. Uh, Title I uh, and II are based on the Commerce Clause, Interstate Commerce, uh, which, the civil, which the Supreme Court had upheld in the past. Okay. Uh, in 1964, Lyndon Johnson declares a war on poverty. We're going to eliminate poverty in the United States. And he has a whole series of programs uh, that he's going to uh, use to abolish poverty. Poverty rates are about 15% in 1965. That's about 30 million people. And he's going to do it by uh, expanding welfare assistance under the Social Security Act. Uh, eligibility requirements are loosened. More money is allocated for people on welfare assistance. And it's no longer for widows and orphans. It's for you know, families in need of assistance of whatever kind. Uh, food stamps, uh, 500,000 recipients at the time. Uh, community action programs, they created a, a whole series of new organizations that received federal funds uh, that were also run by local authorities, uh, not governments, and uh, uh, people in the communities. The mayors began to complain about these because the money was bypassing the local governments. Mayors like Mayor Daly and mayors of other cities complained that this money was flowing into organizations outside their control. And these people were demonstrating for further reforms in their cities. Head Start, a pre-kindergarten education program for poor families. All these are still intact. Uh, of all of them, the community action programs have been reformed to some degree, but the others are still there pretty much intact. 1964 presidential election, it's an overwhelming landslide for Lyndon Johnson and the Democrats. Barry Goldwater carries five states, 61%. They add to the majority in the Senate, somewhat in the House, but it's this election which gives Johnson the overwhelming majorities that he uses to pass the Great Society. So this is uh, one big pillar of the Great Society, uh, Medicare and Medicaid. These are both amendments to the Social Security Act. Uh, Medicare had been talked about from the time of Harry Truman, healthcare for the age at over age 65 and dis disabled people paid for the payroll tax. At that time, equal to half a percent of salaries and wages uh, paid by both employers and employees. That was added to the payroll tax paid under Social Security that at that time was about 3%. So, and at that time, we're talking about a payroll tax of about 3.5% for Social Security and Medicare. So, it was two parts uh, hospital coverage and supplemental medical. Uh, important point the Medi American Medical Association said this is socialized health care. Actually, it wasn't. Uh, Britain and Canada had socialized systems whereby hospitals and doctors are paid and controlled by the government, doctors, employees of the government. Medicare basically took the federal government and they paid the healthcare expenses of the agent. 
by sending money to hospitals and doctors and other providers, later insurance companies. This is a boon for doctors. Uh, ophthalmologists in particular made a killing on Medicare at the time. Uh, they, were they were able to charge uh, $1,200 per cataract surgery, later $3,600 per, per cataract surgery. Um, and they were doing dozens of them per day. Today, the reimbursement is about $500. So over the years, Medicare cracked back on uh, a lot of these payments. Medicaid was government paid health care for Americans at the poverty line and below, shared cost split between the states and the federal government. Uh, so basically, uh, the states set up the programs, they paid for half of it, basically. The federal government paid for the other half. Things have emerged such that the, go the federal government is, is paying for a larger percentage of today than it did in 1965. As noted, both uh, amendments to the Social Security Act. You know, an another significant act passed in, I think signed in November of 1965 by Lyndon Johnson, there he is by the Statue of Liberty. Uh, repealing basically the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1924 and replacing it with a new act of 1965. Uh, they eliminated all quotas and restrictions based on, based on ethnicity and national origin. Uh, they put a cap of visas of 300,000 per year for entry in the United States. There was a family unification aspect. So brothers, sisters, parents, grandparents could join uh, uh, those in the United States. There's a great demand for this. Instead of 300,000 coming per year, it was doubled to about 600,000 by 1967 under family unification. What is happening at the Southern border has nothing to do with this. Uh, this is a kind of legal immigration into the United States. It's now capped at between 500,000 and a million per year. What's happened at the southern border is uh, uh, an aspect of the American asylum system, which is totally different from the immigration system. Voting Rights Act of 1965, another big chunk of the great society. So this is passed uh, again in the summer of 1965. Uh, again, Southern Democrats vote against it but it bans all voting laws that results in the denial of the right to vote on the basis of race and bars election practices that might have discriminatory effects. Uh, section four and five requires various states that uh, had discriminatory election practices in 1964 to get pre-clearance from the Justice Department before they can make any changes in their electoral systems. Uh, Preclearance is required for most of the states across the South. So if they wanted to make a change in their electoral systems, they had to go to the Justice Department to get approval. Uh, the Voting Rights Act has been reapproved many times since 1965. Uh, it has been expanded to cover language groups, linguistic groups, and uh, also in other ways. Supreme Court basically in 19, 2013 struck down sections four and five, the preclearance requirements saying they're outdated. Uh, there are cases in, before the Supreme Court now that will deal with districting under section two of the Voting Rights Act that will be argued this fall. But, Minority registration doubles in Southern states by 1968 from about 20% to 50%, okay? The Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965 is still another one. Uh, this is federal aid to poor schools across the country. Uh, Johnson signs this in April of 1965. Uh, federal money basically going to schools where over 40% of the students uh, are below the poverty line. Uh, it's, it's an effort to equalize educational outcomes. <laughs>
uh, across the country. $1.3 billion spent in 1965. 2021, it's $80 billion. Still another, the Higher Education Act of 1965 uh, authorizes federal scholarship funds and loans for students, teacher training and educational research. Title IX forbidding discrimination on the basis of sex was an amendment to the Higher Education Act. Uh, all of these laws have been approved and reapproved and changed over the years. Uh, current outstanding student loans, it's been changed. It's now about $1.8 trillion, okay? So that's the bulk of the great, great society, very large programs. Uh, the federal government gets into just about every era of American life, which it had not been in before. So in 1965, Daniel Patrick Moynihan as a, an employee of the Labor Department, and he writes this memorandum to the cabinet secretary pointing out that there's a problem with a black family, that 24% of blacks, uh, black births were out of wedlock in 1964 versus 4% of whites. And this is a significant problem that the federal government should address, namely the breakdown of the black family. And he traces it to slavery, discrimination, and racism. Uh, this became very controversial uh, later on, but let's move on because people said Moynihan was blaming the victim. President Johnson uses this memorandum as a basis for his commencement speech at Howard University in 1965, where he says, the great society programs that we're passing are not sufficient because you can't just remove the barriers to racial minorities and expect them to succeed. You got to do all sorts of other things to allow them to succeed. And the Moynihan report is kind of a background for this commencement address. And Johnson is now thinking about some guaranteed annual income for poor people in the United States, which will go well beyond welfare and Medicaid and some other things that he's done. Because in Moynihan's view, welfare was not sufficient because a large amount of the welfare spending went to bureaucrats and social workers. He wanted the money to go to poor people to spend. Uh, so uh, this is what Johnson is contemplating at the time. So we move ahead. So on August 6, 1965, Johnson signs the Voting Rights Act, which had been passed the previous month. Big ceremony in the White House, there's Martin Luther King, and this is now the law of the land. So basically the civil rights revolution in terms of legislation is completed by uh, the summer of 1965. Within a week later, the city of Los Angeles erupts into riots. Uh, you know, 30 or so people are killed, many people injured, big parts of Los Angeles are burned down. It, the event is precipitated almost exactly like many of them just two years ago. There's a confrontation between the police and a black person. Uh, People gather around, there's some violence, pretty soon it erupts into a riot. And there are hundreds of such episodes across the United States in 65, 66, and 1967. So this now happens right at the moment Johnson is completing uh, his civil rights agenda. This was unexpected that this might happen. Johnson abandons the Moynihan Report kind of leaves Moynihan out to dry. Moynihan leaves the Labor Department and moves to New York. But Moynihan is kind of a villain because people said he's blaming the victim. Uh, here they say, they say, what do you expect for people living under poverty? Um, and uh, Moynihan was trying to redress the situation, but he got little credit for that. And uh, as I say, Johnson distanced himself from the Moynihan report. Johnson's popularity now beginning in 1965 declines. Uh, you know, by 1967 or 1968, he's down below 40%. He's now an unpopular president. Uh, 
he can't imagine why this has happened because of the things that he's passed. He thought he'd be a hero like Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And now he's turned into something quite different. And the slide begins, as you see, around 1965. So I think the Great Society basically ends with the signing of the Voting Rights Act and the explosion in Los Angeles in August of 1965. So, you know, much of this is due to the war in Vietnam. Those are deployments to Vietnam, almost no, nothing in 1964. By 1968, we have 550,000 troops in South Vietnam fighting this war. With no end in sight in 1968. Go ahead. Those are the casualties. 1967, 68, 69 are the peak uh, number of, of deaths in Vietnam. Uh, Obviously casualties are three or four times this. So this is the thing that brings down Lyndon Johnson's popularity really. Um, and he was unable to control it. So one of the things that complicates the great society is now the explosion in crime rates. <laughs> That's the homicide rate in Chicago, which beginning in about 1965, roughly increases by four or five times. Same thing happens in cities all over the country. Uh, and people are beginning to associate the rise in crime with Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. That's the US crime rate, 1960 to 2010. See, it goes up pretty rapidly from 1960 to about 1980, levels off and has come down. Might be going up again, but basically homicides, violent crime, tripled or more than tripled from 1960 to 1970, compromising the Great Society. One of the things that happened also at this time was that Blacks are moving out of the South to Northern cities. So the Civil Rights Act was kind of aimed at the problem of the South, segregation in the South. By the time we're passing this, Blacks are moving into the Northern cities, creating a somewhat different problem than the kind you have in the South. And these are mostly people who are moving from farms and rural areas in the South to urban cities. And the pattern historically of people moving from the farms to the cities has usually been a fairly difficult one. This is the share of births to unwed, uh, unwed mothers. Uh, as you can see about 1965, when Moynihan delivers his report, it's a fairly modest issue. Uh, by 1980, uh, black out of wedlock births are 60%, by 1990, they're 70%. So, you know, no one really listened to Moynihan. Maybe it would have been better if they had listened to Moynihan. Moynihan later wrote an article called Defining Deviancy Down, where he said that once a social problem becomes so common, it's no longer, can no longer be re regarded as deviancy, it's now the norm. So people began to say, what's the, what's the big deal about out of wedlock births? I mean, it's very common. It's not, it shouldn't be regarded as anything that's out of the ordinary. And people as a consequence of that began to accept it. Okay, we can move ahead. Um, those are welfare recipients. So beginning in 1960, we have uh, somewhere around 3 million people on welfare. By 1970, it's about 11 million. Uh, in New York City, between 1964 and 1967, welfare recipients went from 300,000 to a million. Basically stayed there until the 1990s. So one of the aspects of the Great Society was this explosion and welfare because they eliminated a lot of the requirements that were put in place in the 1930s and they expanded not only eligibility, but the payments. Uh, I think the poverty line in 1965 was around $2,000 a year. It's $21,000 now for a family, $26,000 now for a family of four. Um, 
I should say that welfare was reformed in 1996. It's no longer called AFDC. It's now called TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. And because of those reforms in the 1990s, the number of people on welfare declined. Uh, let's go back to food stamps, if you can, just for a second. <laughs> food stamp spending also increased uh, from 3 million in 1969 to 45 million in 2012. Uh, also an explosion in expenditures uh, through this period. So kind of one point is that once, once these programs are started, we, have, we begin to get advocacy groups and interest groups surrounding them who advocate every year for their expansion. And that's pretty much what's happened on every one of these programs that's led to their expansion. Okay, that's the, the federal budget in 1970 and in 2013. I showed you the budget in 1960, 67% defense spending. So now by 1970, defense spending is down to 42%. It's down to 18% in 2013. Medi Medicare and Social Security are 18% in 1970. They're up to 39% uh, in 2013. It's over 40% today, I think. Uh, but basically the Great Society brought about a revolution in federal budgeting, reducing uh, defense spending certainly, and greatly expanding welfare programs, especially Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. It's also increased mandatory spending as opposed to discretionary spending so that the federal budget is to a large extent on some, something called auto, uh, automatic pilot. So much of the spending is mandatory because we've approved spending and the recipients if they're eligible uh, deserve the entitlement spending. So mandatory spending, social security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment and disability, welfare, veterans benefits and interest on the debt. Those are things we have to spend on. Discretionary is defense and a bunch of other things. So I'm coming to the end. Let's go through a few things here. That's total Medicare spending from 1970 to 2020. <laughs> uh, 19 million people are on it in 2021. In 1966, 64 million today. Almost a uh, trillion dollars spent per year on Medicare. Uh, as a consequence, partly of the Great Society, demand for healthcare uh, expenditures goes up. Therefore, cost of healthcare goes up. Uh, you can see there inflation in medical services has likely has, has tripled uh, inflation and other kinds of expenditures. This is Medicaid expending. It's now $835 billion as of this year. It started out fairly modest. Uh, about two thirds of this is paid for by the federal government. The rest of it is paid for by the states. The states or the federal government sets forth most of the eligibility requirements. Healthcare spending of credit GDP. We spend close to 20% per year on healthcare in the United States, fueled to a great degree by Medicare and Medicaid. Poverty rate in the United States goes down rapidly as a consequence of the programs of the 1960s, but by the mid 70s, it stops. Uh, poverty level goes down to about 10, 11, 12%, bounces around, pretty much stays there uh, down to the present time. Yeah, I think uh, some people say that the Immigration Act of 1965 may have been the far, most far reaching element of the Great Society. So, you know, from 19, you see from 1924 down to 1970, the percent of immigrants in the United States declines. And then beginning about 1970 due to the 1965 Act begins to climb. So this is the percentage of uh, foreign born people in the United States. Uh, so now it's around 17, 18%. In the mid 1960s, maybe 5%. Let's go ahead. 
So in 1960, 84% of immigrants were from uh, Western Europe and Canada. Because of the Immigration Act, you can see the distribution of immigrants in 2013. 14% from Euro Western Europe and Canada, Southeast Asia, Latin America, Mexico, and others. So we've greatly changed the mix of immigration into the United States as a consequence of the Immigration Act. That was not foreseen at the time. It only begins to develop rapidly in the 1980s. The Voting Rights Act uh, uh, basically had a very rapid effect on voter on black voter turnout across the South. Uh, the gap between whites and blacks is pretty much closed by 2004. And Justice Roberts cites this table as a basis for uh, voting down the pre-clearance criteria in the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This is done in 2013. He says they're outdated, therefore unconstitutional. And the Congress, if it wants to reestablish re them, has to, has to create new standards. Uh, they have not yet been able to do that because of the politics of the Congress. Um, but just in terms of voter turnout, Voting Rights Act does succeed across the South in getting rid of the disparity between blacks and whites. But the Voting Rights Act was also applied to districting. So does the Voting Rights Act require that states create minority districts so that blacks have an equal chance to be represented in the Congress? That's a very controversial position. But in order to create such districts, they had to create things of the kind that they did in North Carolina in 1990. That doesn't look like a compact or contiguous congressional district, but it was drawn to pack in as many blacks as possible across the state to create a black district. Go ahead. Uh, that's a district in Houston, Texas that was declared unconstitutional in the 1990s in Bush v. Vera in a Supreme Court case. And basically the Supreme Court said in the 1990s that we're not gonna allow racially gerrymandered districts where the main criterion in drawing the districts is race. You can use it as a factor, but you can't use it as a guiding criteria. However, states are not certain how to deal with this. We've got to use race to some degree, but we can't use it too much. So where do we draw the line? So, you know, there's a, an important case, Merrill versus Milligan, to be argued before the Supreme Court in October, where this is going to be perhaps resolved one way or another as to how the Voting Rights Act applies to districting in the states. So I'm coming to the end here. So that's basically, I've gone through the legislative aspects of the Great Society and some of the other things that complicated the Great Society, but there is also the whole cultural revolution of, the, of that period. The music, the demonstrations, uh, all the other things that happened. Apollo and Dionysius, this is the Woodstock Music Festival of 1969. All the young people gathering for their music festival, you know, it rains and they have to send helicopters in to deliver food and ferry people out and so on, but it's a great event. And of course, the, uh, the moon program that Kennedy inaugurated in 1962 was called the Apollo program. And we did succeed in putting a man on the moon on July 20th, 1969 almost exactly the same time that you had the Woodstock gathering. So in a, in a sense, the United States comes out of the 1960s with this divided culture uh, uh, of represented by Woodstock on the one hand and Apollo on the other hand, technology uh, versus happiness uh, with the whole ba legislative background of the Great Society complicating things going forward. So I'll just stop there and uh, take any questions. So I managed to do this in a little bit less than an hour. So 
Yes, that was excellent. Yeah, wonderful review, Jim. And um, with your incisive comments, it's very good. So, so Shep, take it away. OK, Shep. go ahead. Thanks, Jim. I would like to have my students uh, hear this talk to fill them in on the things that uh, the rest of us lived through. Um, uh, I just I do want to either challenge or clarify one of your points, and that is about welfare policy. Uh, because one of the things that's notable about the legislation of the Great Society is how little attention was paid to uh, means-tested income maintenance programs, largely because Lyndon Johnson shared Franklin Roosevelt's distrust of the dole. Um, he, he supported uh, programs for education, for training, for community action. But when you look at the programs that you highlighted, which grew very rapidly starting in the late 1960s, AFDC, that was the courts and the states. Uh, food stamps, that was Congress in the 1970s and Nixon. Um, the federalization of, of means-tested programs like SSI, that was Nixon and Moynihan. Um, so I really don't, it, I don't see much support among, for Lyndon Johnson, um, some of his uh, for the guaranteed income. Um, that I might have missed something there. Certainly Moynihan was thinking and talking about that. But he had much more support with Nixon than he did with uh, Johnson. Um, I, I will just add that Social Security is something that Johnson did greatly expand, uh, as well as Medicare and Medicaid. But uh, my main point here is that to view the Great Society is really supporting a substantial increase in welfare, as the con term is commonly known. Um, it, it is not accurate, and it's really surprising how reluctant Johnson was to expand that. So you might um, disagree with part of that, but interest in your response. Oh, I think I think this is true of a lot of things that happened after 1965. That a lot of these programs took on a different life of their own, as advocacy groups and the states uh, rallied around them and began to expand them. It is interesting, I agree, that it was Richard Nixon who supported the guaranteed annual income um, and by prodding from Moynihan. Uh, we don't know what Johnson would have done had it not been for the riots that developed in 1965. He did begin to speak in 1965 about expanding welfare and he never got around to it because of the things that happened. But uh, yes, a lot of these programs, once they were in place, were expanded by other forces after Lyndon Johnson. He didn't necessarily anticipate them. He just got them rolling. Do you want to follow up on that, Shep, just since you're such, such an expert? Uh, I, I guess I view Johnson, I mean, number one, I think you're completely correct about uh, the forces set in motion, um, the new advocacy groups. Say, for example, why, why were some of these programs expanded in part through community action? I'd also say through the, the Legal Services Corporation that was an outgrowth of the, of, uh, the Great Society. I think a really uh, an unappreciated um, factor. And John, uh, Johnson, right. never for, Johnson never foresaw any of that. Now, right. he did not. And when he began to see it happen about the time he was leaving office, he was quite bitter about it. Right. And uh, he got a lot of political grief for the community uh, action program. The legal services uh, was set up basically by Sergeant Shriver, who he put in charge of the war on poverty. Um, and I think he greatly regretted that as well. Uh, but I do, I, I guess I have a more of a sense that like uh, Franklin Roosevelt, on whom he modeled himself, that the, the disagreement with means-tested programs, as uh, Wilbur Cohen would always say, a program for the poor is a poor program, that the conventional wisdom in the New Deal, and I think for Johnson was, that you wanted to have a variety of programs like Social Security, like Medicare, that wouldn't be means-tested because they're so hard to run and they're so demeaning. Yeah. 
Thank you, Tom Palmer and then Dimitri. Uh, I want my 29 year old son who went to Duke and studied economics and history to see this for sure. Um, for this perspective, he's a supporter of Pelosi and AOC. But I just had a quick question on your numbers. Are the dollar figures, um, maybe it said and I couldn't read it, are they adjusted for inflation? Uh, most of them are not. I try to give the real dollar figures. So a few of them might be adjusted in current dollars, but most of them I try to put in terms of 1965 dollars. So the the poverty level in 1965 is about two thousand dollars per year. Okay, so but, the programs went up, and the numbers were the dollar numbers were much yeah, greater those, today. Those numbers on those tables are basically the real dollars. Oh, they are. Nominal, okay. nominal they are. dollars, yeah. They are. Okay, thank you. Dimitri. Uh, great, thank you so much. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned at the start of the, of the talk, uh, the, this is the third of the three great American reform movements, the Progressive Era and the New Deal coming first. So I was wondering if you could say something about the differences, both, both in the the origins than the consequences. And in particular, so the progressive era came about, was sparked by mass popular demand, right? So rural movements, populists, the Grange, and then progressive movements for urban reform, labor reform, all of that. So there was a mass demand from the bottom up for the reforms that then came uh, under the various progressive presidents. And then the New Deal was obviously in response to a, a crisis, right, to the, to the Great Depression. So. Uh, as you said, the Great Society is a bit different in this way because it came in a time of relative affluence. Uh, the, it didn't come as a product of great uh, mass popular demand for uh, economic reform or anything like that. So how does the relative top-down character of the Great Society, how, what does that explain about the kinds of programs that we saw and then the, the long-term legacy of, of the programs? <laughs> That's a very good question. I should ask Shep to uh, jump in here. Um, now, you know, I think you're right. It, progressivism was also a period of relative affluence. It wasn't born out of destitution. That was a, the, the New Deal, obviously, is a response to the Great Depression. And the Great Society also is a period of, of affluence. John Kenneth Galbraith wrote a book in 1959 called the Affluent Society. And that was, an ex that was an overstatement, but it kind of the idea was that uh, the United States is now wealthy enough to be able to pay for all these things. Um, as I noted that the progressive, progressive reforms were a lot of them were constitutional amendments. You could never pass these things today. Had it not been for the, the income tax amendment, we wouldn't have the government we have today. Uh, I don't know, you know, it was amazing that they were able to pass those things. Now, if people have mentioned that progressivism was kind of a mix between expertise and popular demand. The idea that, one idea that the progressives had is that government ought not to be dr driven by politics, but they ought, ought to be directed by expert management. Uh, uh, what is political about, you know, keeping the streets clean uh, and controlling crime and all the rest of it. We needed, from their point of view, a more expert driven government. Uh, you know, the, the New Deal was something different. The first phase of the New Deal focused heavily on financial reform. So you got the United States off the gold standard, for example. You had deposit insurance. Uh, you had various banking reforms so the banks could not speculate in the stock market any longer. And once he did that, in the second, in the second Congress, he did Social Security and labor union organi organizing. Uh, much of the great society, civil rights was obviously driven by popular demand. That was a response to the things that were happening across the South. And uh, because of World War II and Hitler, based uh, with a racial, racial ideology, it was felt that the United States was way out of step with where the world was and where we ought to be in terms of race. 
And those are all factors that went into the civil rights uh, legislation. Uh, in terms of the rest of it, you know, much of it was uh, uh, Medicare, for example, had been promoted by Harry Truman. So it was part of the democratic platform going back. Medicaid less so. So, you know, I'm not sure how to answer your question. Maybe Shep could between expertise and popular demand. Shep, do you have any comments on that? Um, I think it's a great question. Um, the only, I'll just give one anecdote to, to um, emphasize the point, which is after Kennedy's assassination, Johnson got his advisors together and said, this election's coming right up. What should be our theme? And one possibility was the problems of the suburbs, and the other was war on poverty, great society. Um, it could have gone the other way, um, and we would have had a much more boring world. Uh, yeah. Though John, D Johnson did the Great Society, there was a great deal of quality of life stuff in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the, I didn't mention this, but, but one of the things that, a couple of the things that they did under Johnson, we had the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities are thrown in there. And public television is thrown in there as well as a piece of the Great Society. It's usually not mentioned, but these are both, all of them are legacies of the Great Society. Mm -hmm. And unification as well. Which one? Highway beautification. Yes, that's right. Lady Bird Johnson was in on that. So, you know, they kind of wanted to kind of reform America and elevate America across the board. It didn't, obviously, the, uh, the stuff about the arts and humanities didn't succeed very well, <laughs> at least from my point of view. Russ, please. Thanks. Thank you for that um, for that really interesting lecture and 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 education really on what the what the ingredients were in, in the Great Society. I have one key question. When it, the question is about the endurance of the Great Society, and you mentioned in the talk that every program, you know, generates its beneficiaries, and those beneficiaries sort of organize to maintain the program, and that's. That's one kind of explanation for why 50 years later, the, the, the programs and the policies and the laws are still active. Um, another kind of explanation might be to say that the people like what the people endorse the purposes of the great society, just put to the side whether the particular policies are considered optimal. But when it comes to medical care for the aged, you know, subsequent presidents like George uh, w. Bush campaign on expanding Medicare and, and creating kind of additional entitlements with under the Medicare umbrella or Medicaid or education or environment or arts and media, housing, consumer protection, that these continue to be things that many people, many citizens expect the government, purposes that many citizens expect the government to serve. And that's really why we still have the Great Society 50 years later. So I wondered if I wanted to invite you to comment a little bit on how you understand the endurance of it. Yeah, well, you know, obviously I think Medicare, like Social Security, is an extremely popular program. Uh, and it would be hard to uh, substantially reduce Medicare because it is popular, also has a big constituency. I think something, something like Medicaid is probably somewhat less popular, if you know what I mean. The states have been trying to reform Medicaid for a long time. They think they're spending too much on it. And so it's also a program for the poor. So I'm not sure that's driven so much by popularity, uh, you know, but there are interests organized around it. It's a big program. You And there have been efforts to reform it. Uh, you know, I don't know about a lot of the rest of it. So as I say, Voting Rights Act, I don't know if we want to conclude that in the welfare programs, but I think the Voting Rights Act has been substantially gutted by the courts. And I don't see that Shep is shaking his head. Uh, I'll let Shep talk in a minute, but I don't see that there, there's a lot of pushback on that from the Democratic Party. Uh, not sure so much from the Republican Party. 
the endowments, I'm not sure those are particularly popular. They're somewhat driven by the advocacy groups. Um, and uh, what are some of the, you know, higher aid to higher education? That's kind of a mix, I would say. Aid to elementary and secondary schools. Look, the Department of Education, you're right, is very popular. Uh, Republicans have attacked the Department of Education, and that would include these programs. And, you know, that's a kind of a third rail. So, you know, I think it's a mixed bag. You're certainly right that many of these programs remain popular, and that's why they can't be touched. Some of them uh, have well organized interest groups and advocacy groups, and they're difficult to change. Welfare would be an example. They did reform welfare. Welfare did become quite unpopular, I'd say. Uh, in, in, in the 80s and into the 90s, even Bill Clinton said it had to be reformed. So it's kind of a mixed bag, but no one is going to change, is, is going to take away Medicare, just like Social Security and some of the other ones. Shep, you shook your head on voting rights. I, I didn't mean to be so demonstrative, but I would just say that you say what was important about the Voting Rights Act, it was number one, eliminating the literacy test. That was far away more than important. And we've done that nationwide. The registration um, requirements. Um, the, uh, we did change the law in 1982 saying that, if, that, that laws that have the effect of, of diminishing representation minorities, that's still on the books. That can still be um, enforced by the courts. The only thing that has been taken away is preclearance, which means that you have to challenge after the law has been enacted rather than do so beforehand. Yeah. So I think the extent to which uh, the Shelby County reduced the significance of the Voting Rights Act has been, has been exaggerated. Now you do have the districting issue. Right, so there, there, yeah, in, in yeah, the there, is the, there is the idea that districting uh, for congressional and legislative districts uh, if, they, if the votes of minorities are diluted in the districting process, that can be illegal under the Voting Rights Act. Yes. And the only thing that's changed is where, it can, where and when it can be challenged. Uh, yes. But the courts have also said that you can't draw district lines on the basis of race. You can, again, just like in affirmative action, you can use it as a factor, but not as a decisive factor. And I would say that the court will will know it when they see it, and you can never tell yeah. when they're going to see it. So there is, as I say, there's a case to be argued in the fall uh, in, from Alabama on the under the Voting Rights Act, the districting aspect, where in the state of Alabama, about 26 percent of the population are black, and they have seven congressional districts, and one has been carved out for blacks. But the blacks are claiming that they should have two districts mm -hmm. if they're 26% of the population. And so they have drawn a second district in which there would be a black majority in Alabama. And the uh, Supreme Court has stayed that. They're keeping the current map, the one district in place, while this other one is litigated. The state of Alabama is saying you drew the second district on the basis of race. Mm -hmm. And so that'll be argued. One of the things is, is that a black district is a democratic district since blacks vote 95% for Democrats. So is there a distinction between a party district and a racial district? And so they're basically the same thing. So does a racial gerrymander basically boil down to a party gerrymander? Uh, because it certainly looks like one, because they're, it, it, instead of saying we want two black seats, we want two democratic seats. So that is going to be litigated, and I'm not sure how that will come out. I do believe the controversy of a row may spill over onto this, because uh, uh, how far will the Supreme Court dare to go? And uh, after, after they do row, Will they now dare to strike down that aspect of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act? I'm not sure. How, where will they go on the Harvard admissions case? That's again under Section 6 of the Civil Rights Act, I think. 
will they dare to knock that out? I'm not sure. Um, I, uh, so if things proceed as they appear that they might, they will strike down Roe, they'll strike down the district aspect of section two of the Voting Rights Act, and they'll strike down the quota aspect of section six of the Civil Rights Act and the Harvard case. That would strike a significant blow at what you might call the diversity regime that the Democratic Party has built itself around. And in terms of admissions, districting, row, et cetera, will that majority dare to do that? I don't, I don't know. But uh, if they did do that, I think that would be, a, that would be, but you're right. The Voting Rights Act did achieve its aim. It got rid of the literacy requirements. It changed the registration requirements. It allowed for the expansion of black voting in the South. And the Supreme Court struck down the poll tax the next year. Uh, Paul Peterson and then Andy Zwick. Paul, you're still muted, as always. I am pleased to hear your about your new ideas, Jim. Uh, Hi, Paul. How are you? Great talk. Uh, lots of facts. Um, the, the idea that I, I joined late because I had another meeting, but what um, the idea that was new here, uh, and I'm not sure whether you really meant to do this or not, is there seems to be a distinction between the great society and the war on poverty. And uh, the question is, is the Johnson, did Johnson unleash a war on poverty or did he unleash a movement towards a great society? And you might say that the more important development has been the movement towards the great society. After all, we haven't really reduced poverty uh, by all that much, uh, except for seniors. Um, so, uh, if, if it's the great society, maybe it's a middle class, upper middle class movement, not really a war to help the poor. And there's so much of what we now see looking back that has changed uh, that it makes sense to think of the Democratic Party as the party of the upper middle class and the Republican Party as the party of the working class and uh, disadvantaged in the society. Uh, and it seems to be moving in that direction uh, as we speak. So uh, if you think about the Clean Air Act and the establishment of EPA and all the regulatory reforms that have been put in, all of the uh, efforts uh, to uh, equalize relationship between men and women, these are upper middle class issues. <clears throat> this is what they really care about. Uh, they, they want to stop climate change by the year 2100. They don't want poor people to have a better meal tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, it, it's, you know, the welfare program didn't really take off. It was capped. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it is true. We've got the food stamp program, but, um, the Medicaid program still has a lot of um, problems with it. Whereas Medicare, which is a middle-class program, it's, it's for people at age 65 to continue to have the health insurance they've enjoyed in the past um, and um, you know not have to pay for it. So extremely popular. So I don't know. This is just how I'm reacting to your your presentation. What do you what do you think of that? Well, thank you, Paul. You know, I guess I see the war on poverty as an aspect of the Great Society. Uh, after all, it did involve Medicaid, and it did involve the various poverty programs. I do think you're correct in thinking that as things evolved, the war on poverty kind of got pushed somewhat to the side in favor of a lot of other things like Medicare, the environment, uh, 
uh, the sexes and the genders, uh, also race relations to some degree. And of course, it was also true that we never did spend all that much on welfare. The amount of money that we spent on welfare, people always exaggerate it because of, of the moral aspects of welfare. But I think today the federal government is spending, I don't know, maybe it's around $30 billion on welfare. Yeah, uh, it's just a pale minor element yeah, of it's very, it's social very security. Think of how much is spent on social security, how much is spent. That, that's 90% of it or 80% of the total. Yeah. Well, we got, yeah, so between social security and Medicare, we got about $2 trillion. And that's 40% of the federal budget. Welfare, maybe $30 billion. It's fairly small. Uh, it did probably get uh, exaggerated somewhat because of uh, other social pathologies surrounding welfare, such as crime and other things. And you, and you should remember that Social Security expands very dramatically under Johnson and also Nixon, the two of them together. I, I always think of it as the Johnson-Nixon era. Yes, I think that's probably true. Uh, of course, Nixon did the uh, cost of living adjustments in Social Security, and Johnson expanded it to some degree. Uh, you can get it when you're younger. They are trying to restrict it a little bit because of budget, but these are these are the gigantic aspects of the Great Society and the New Deal. Those two things. On the Democratic Party, yeah, I think that's an important point. How the Democratic Party has emerged as an upper middle class educated party mixed with the uh, lower classes, I would say. It's a kind of a coalition of the top and the bottom versus the middle. Uh, and uh, I don't know that that was foreseen at the time. It's not even embedded in their rhetoric to a great degree, but uh, I think that's kind of where the two parties are, are somewhat headed. Uh, and uh, so, of course, Medicare remains extremely popular, but, uh, and of course, I would agree that the Democratic Party was changed drastically over the years by what happened in the Great Society. Andy? All right. Jim, thanks so much for your fine talk and comprehensive overview. Um, I wanted to ask you about a topic uh, that we've compared notes on in, in the past and in the context of um, shattered consensus, that the consequences of government spending and debt that uh, for many years we talked about this and uh, certain aspects of the critique of uh, the spending falling on deaf ears in the context of low interest rates and not really paying a, a price, so to speak, for the indebtedness. Wanted to ask you about your thoughts about the current moment and how things um, in our politics may be affected by inflation, rising interest rates, et cetera, et cetera. Well, thank you, Andy. Well, um, that's a little bit orthogonal to the great society, though it is related because of the spending, of course. Uh, we've had two balanced budgets since 1969. One of them was 1969, and that was, I think, mainly because Lyndon Johnson took Social Security from off budget and put it on budget. And so it's a little bit of a phony thing. And then I think Clinton balanced the budget in the late 1990s. Otherwise, uh, we've been running on debt for you know, 50 plus years. Uh, and that is somewhat an aspect uh, of the great society. Uh, we've been able to do that because of low interest rates over the last 20 or 30 years, really last 40 years, uh, and our ability to borrow abroad because of the strength of the dollar as a reserve currency in the world. So uh, at the same time, economic growth is slowing in the United States. 
as I said, it was 6% in the mid 60s. In the 1960s, it averaged about 4.5% per year of real GDP. In the 70s, about 3.5%. In the 80s and 90s, a little over 3%. And the last two decades, it's down to around 2% per year GDP. So uh, GDP in the United States, uh, it's growing at about half the rate it grew in the 1960s. And of course, we've been able to sustain our standard of living by borrowing all this debt that you're talking about, $30 trillion in federal debt, 22 trillion held by the public. So uh, the spending is gonna continue. It's almost on automatic pilot because of what you mentioned in terms of mandatory spending, that's gonna keep going. Interest rates are going up. I think we spend something like three to $400 billion per year on interest on the debt at, at very low interest rates. That is, you know, seven or eight percent of federal spending. What happens when interest rates double? That we're no longer, you know, selling ten-year Treasury bonds at one and a half percent, but we now have to pay five percent or six percent or seven percent per year. Uh, that will become a problem. Well, what do people around the world don't want to lend us money? at low interest rates anymore to finance our debt. What happens then? I think that, that would be a problem. Can we sustain uh, under the current economy with its interest rate regime, the kind of spending and borrowing that we've been engaged in? And what happens if we can't do it anymore? Uh, if we actually have to cut these programs because we don't have the money to pay for them? What, what happens then? I believe that will happen. I don't know when, uh, I suspect in the not too distant future, uh, you know, the younger people here will be around to see it. I don't know if, you know, I will, but that when that ha with, if and when, whenever that happens, it will uh, force a kind of a confrontation with all of our social programs and our government spending and the kinds of uh, programs that Americans are used to getting for free and the realities of raising the money for it. Um, I think that in the last fiscal year, I think we did spend around $6 trillion. You can check that. A lot of that was one-time COVID spending. I think we borrowed $3 trillion in the last two years. Well, you know, $3 trillion is about, well, it's about one seventh or one eighth of GDP. It's a lot. We're not gonna be able to continue to do that. Fortunately, COVID is over and we might not have to, but I kind of agree with the point that we have a rendezvous out in the future with our, the spending on our social programs and our ability to generate revenues uh, to pay for them because of what's happening to interest rates. Interest rates in the last 40 years have been at a historic low. Alexander Hamilton and his plan, he was, he was willing to pay 6% for 10 year bonds. Through the 19th century, interest rates were about 4%. Uh, in 1980, they were 18, 19, 20%. And, and by last year, two years ago, they were down around 1%. So we've had a very favorable interest rate regime since the early 1980s, which appears to be changing. Uh, so, you know, where that goes, I think, but I think that's out there. That's all I'd say about that. Uh, I thought it would happen sooner, but I, but I think it is out there. We have two more questions, Matt Contenesi and then Dennis Hale, please. Uh, hi, Jim. Thank you for the presentation. It was an excellent survey. I wonder if you could situate the Great Society in the broader history of American liberalism. As I look at what happened afterward, and I think of the next big effort to expand the welfare state, Obama's new foundation, he wasn't entirely successful. It was a very difficult process and engendered a huge reaction. And then the current president, and his attempts to build back better uh, don't seem to be going very well either. 
in his bill uh, that they passed the Recovery Act last year is also creating, uh, I think, political conditions that will lead to a backlash. So is the Great Society the apogee? Or uh, is it just one more step on the, the path to, to greater government? Well, I think you could say probably it was, it was a, right now, looking back on it, it was the apogee. Of course, the spending has continued by its own momentum. But you are right that it's been difficult to generate support for aggressive new additions to the American welfare state. Obamacare uh, faced a great deal of resistance, but it wasn't that large. So Obamacare probably affected, I'd have to go back and look at this. I mean, if you look at Medicare with you know 65 million people and Social Security with 65 million people and Medicare with 80 million people and food stamps with 40 or 50 million people, I think Obamacare may have affected 20 million people. So you get an expansion of Medicaid out of it. Some states didn't even do it. And then you have all the subsidies to purchase health insurance, which some people took advantage of, some didn't. So it's a, in the context of the Great Society, it's a relatively modest program. The New Deal engendered a great deal of momentum behind it because it was so easy to finance and pay for social security for the reasons I, I set forth. There were in 1935, there were seven people working for one people drawing benefits and the benefits are fairly small and the taxes are fairly small. Today, what did I say? 65, 70 million people drawing social security and Medicare. The American workforce is around 150, 60 million people, give or take. So it's about two to one. So you got two people paying benefits for every person, paying taxes for every single person drawing benefits. How far can you go with that? And, you know, I, I think we're expanding our labor force mostly by immigration, uh, not by, you know, live births or people growing up in the United States. So, yes, I would say that's a crisis. So looking back on it, I'd say, uh, the Great Society represented a peak of sorts. It happened because the New Deal was so popular and it was implemented so well and so easy to implement at the time because people were drawing benefits and the taxation very well. And people were drawing benefits for 20 or 30 years and they'd pay very little into it. And that's, that's all changed. So yes, I would say that just kind of looking backward, we're not going to have another great society type deal. Uh, we don't have the resources for it. And, you know, a lot of the aspects are not as popular as they were before, so leaving aside Medicare. Thank you. Dennis, you got the last question. Uh, thanks. Um, all of, uh, <clears throat> all of what has, um, all of what the 60s and 70s have left us with, in addition to a lot of debt, would seem to be a kind of moribund Congress. Um, and I wonder if you can draw some connections, if they, if they actually exist, if you think, between the deformation of Congress and uh, the legacy of the great society. Yeah. Well, that's a, that is a great question. And it's, it's no doubt true that the Congress uh, uh, looks like it's a prisoner of forces outside its control to some degree. You know, there are people who say that it looked like that a little bit like in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, I think it is true that the, the mandatory aspect of the Great Society programs has basically tied the hands of Congress to do much new. I mean, where are we gonna go after we've done all the great society programs and all that they've cost. Uh, you know, Republicans have tried to kind of reform, or, but they've without any significant success at it. Uh, momentum has moved into the executive branch, I agree, into the courts. So I haven't thought about it that much. I don't know if Shep is still on or somebody's still on a comment on the paralysis of the Congress. 
uh, in all this. You know, one of the things is that, the, you know, the Democrats controlled the Congress from the New Deal up until the 1990s. And they're able to write all this legislation. Republicans were able to capture Congress in the 1990s, partly because of their critique of all these great society programs. Now they weren't able to keep it and so on. But uh, the great society has institutionalized policy to a tremendous degree and it's tied the hands of the Congress to a great degree and doing very much about them. I think that's true. I think Shep had said he had to leave it too, right? right? Yeah. Um, so if there, if there's another follow-up or comment or question, you can ask. I, it. I get to uh, I get to praise the speaker. <laughs> That's my job, Chairman. This has been a wonderful review, as someone said for for, for students, uh, and and of course for people like me too, who need to be brought up with a lot of fact. And as I say, your incisive comment. Okay. It's been a great talk, and thanks so much for coming to us. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you in person sometime fairly soon. Great. Thanks, everybody. It's been wonderful.